Hey everybody, Big Z here. I just wanted to start off this episode of the podcast with a little bit of context about what you're going to be hearing uh, in the first 10 minutes of this episode. So uh, if you turned into the last episode of the podcast, you know that we uh, interviewed Chuck from Pro Eagle along with Russell from Buggy Whip. And that was at the UTV Takeover event uh, in Coos Bay, Oregon. Uh, During that event, we did a test uh, uh, live stream from the dunes of short course racing. Uh, That event um, turns out fried our MacBook Pro that we use for all of our editing and things like that. Uh, And along with that process, uh, we also lost some footage. And in the case of this episode that you're about to get into, uh, we lost some audio. Uh, There was a bunch of uh, digital corruption, things that have happened uh, that uh, has kind of delayed this episode from coming out. So you would have expected this to come out last week uh, if we were doing our weekly. Um, But uh, we had to do some rescuing, some some forensic uh, modification on these files, you might say. Um, And uh, if we hadn't, this is what you would have heard. And yeah, that was pretty horrible. So uh, I did a bunch of magic on my end to make this audio work. Uh, so the first uh, roughly nine minutes of this episode, maybe less, uh, it's going to sound like a really, 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 really bad Zoom call. Um, but then it'll jump right into the great audio that we normally have. And uh, you can enjoy the rest of the episode. So uh, sorry for the delay. Sorry for the first uh, nine minutes of quality. But uh, you'll get there, we'll get to that mark, and we'll have a great sounding episode like you expect from us. And uh, I just appreciate your patience and uh, yeah, sticking through all the all the crazy times we've been going through lately. So uh, enjoy the episode and we'll see you later. Welcome back to the Side by Side Guys Off Road Podcast. I am back here in the Off Road Syndicate trailer, full of good products and interesting people, uh, especially the ones eating burritos down in the end down there in the beards. Uh, we have uh, UTV Takeover Coos Bay 2022. Uh, it's been a long week. We're on the final stretch here, home stretch of Saturday, and uh, we've uh, we had a good time out testing our Charlie's on uh, short course racing. Had a live stream test there. Uh, so hopefully today we'll be doing a live stream of the uh, Willie Fest and Hot Fest competitions. That should be uh, super interesting. Uh, today I'm joined by a guest we've had on before uh, and a new guest uh, to the podcast. Uh, today I'm joined by Brandon Twitchell from HCR and uh, I'm going to push the P- uh, Pete N- Negri. <laughs> see, see, see. Yeah, I, I told you. you. I got to yeah, you, I was, I was watching the curly whites over here, and I got <laughs> distracted. Uh, how do we say your last name? It, it was close. We were close. I was one of the most common ways. Pete Negretti. Negretti. Like Aunt Gretti. Yeah, close though. <laughs> um, so, thanks for coming on, uh, uh, Pete. You're with Pro Armor, uh, and uh, and Brandon, you're with HCR. Obviously, you've been on the show before. You know how this goes. Mm-hmm. It's pretty much a laid back conversation for us, but. Uh, yep. Uh, how have things been since the last time we talked? Oh man, it's been a while. Yeah, I mean it's been over a year, I think. Yeah, yeah, things have uh, things been wild, man. We've uh, just continuing to grow, streamline our processes, awesome new products. I think you got a new building since we, we talked. We did, yeah. How how did that go? And, and what was your change like from footprint wise? Like, how did you so we moved up? all of our manufacturing. So before we had welders just jammed in every single corner we could, working on top of each other. We were able to lay out the floor plan of this new building where the uh, production line is just a lot more efficient, the way things are stacked. It's just a lot more um, professional working environment. Right. Than if I remember right from what I've seen in the videos, the, the welders are, are back. They're back or to all their parts and all their like kits they're putting together. Right. So they just have to turn around, grab something, drop off, finish product, move on. Yep. Yep. Uh, that kind of workflow is not only more efficient, but it just makes life easier for them. It makes exactly. them enjoy their job a little bit better. Yeah, uh, a lot less chasing around the parts and everything else. Yeah, for, for sure. sure. So, so your manufacturing all went to one house. So, do you have two locations now? So, yeah, we we still have our old building. So, we've still got some offices in there and uh, all of our R and D and our vehicles and stuff. So, they're only what? Not even half hours. a block from each other. <laughs> yeah. So. We do a lot of back and forth, but it's it's not bad considering. So do you so so do you have a warehouse full of cool cars like rugged radios, or or do you guys? Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, we have a decent <laughs> fleet. Usually we've got anywhere from five to six cars. 
and you got any prototypes we should talk about that we can't say what was going on? No, no, not right <laughs> now. I'm being honest. There's, I wish I could tell you yeah. something different, but right now it's, it's all Wait, out in the air. Right? You guys just finished uh, your Destination X, or Polaris uh, X build, right? Yep, yep. We did a big, nasty Ranger for that one. and uh, it's A little rundown on that, because it's a, it's a beast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You had the Blue Ranger in, in uh, San Hollow last year. Is that the same car? or did No, no, totally different car. So this one's a uh, North Star, so it's got the HVAC, um, power windows, all that good stuff. Um, but we just developed a launch travel kit for the 22 Ranger, and I was just going to keep it practical and on 35s. and Practical, <laughs> practical on 35s. <35. laughs> <laughs> That's practical in my opinion, but... Uh, anyways, they just looked so cool with, with portals and big tires. I couldn't help myself. So so we did big six-inch portals, our long travel on 39-inch tires. Um, I usually use a VFG, like G for truck tire. But as we found out in San Paulo, those, <laughs> those don't agree with little parts. Yeah. Uh, so we used uh, actual UTV tire on this one. So it actually drives a lot better. and a little bit more user friendly. Yeah, I rode with you out to the internet, and it's like I told you in the car, it's like it eats up that little chatter. It just rolls right over like it's nothing. Yeah. Uh, but I guess in the when it's getting chunky out there, it's a little bit of a top heavy beast to to try to manage that. Yeah, yeah, I've gotten a little bit more uh, comfortable <laughs> as the days have gone on. <laughs> on the dunes, I've, we've hit a few hills we probably shouldn't have, but it's. Done job. So may, may, may or may not have stretched the legs on him the other night. <laughs> you know, going back to camp. <laughs> yeah, I think we got it airborne once. Do we need to get you up on doing like the big roost at the top of the lip? That would be very difficult. <laughs> might have to drop in a small block to do that. Yeah. <laughs> that thing's big. It's, yeah. it's an awesome vehicle. Yeah, and you got the rack on it with like a grill. We went out and did a Polaris ride with it. Uh, you you smoked some weed for everybody out there and. Handed out ice cream and all sorts of stuff. Yeah, that's the funnest part about it. It's just a very, it's a fun marketing tool at the end of the day, you know, to, to get everybody out. Uh, Rock would put a killer stereo in it. Um, yeah, we, I think that's good. We went, we did uh, Ferrari tan leather seats and, you know, it's just a, just a fun. I think Russell car. from Buggy Whip said it. It's just a real true vibe car. Like, yeah. you just go out and you vibe with it. Like, whatever that vibe is, yep. you can just chill with it. And you and your homies can relax and play. Ball I love just riding shotgun in it or in the back seat. I mean, yeah. riding around, big stereo, draws a ton of attention. It's been sitting... Yeah, it's in windows and everything. I haven't been the windows yet. That's the only thing I have. They're pretty stereo. dark, though, that's factory. It's not factory. Yeah. Yeah, it's been... I mean, it's been sitting in front of our booth or Jason, my booth, all week, and it... All day long. Everybody. I like, take pictures in front of it, ask me questions. No, it's a it's an awesome build. I'm I'm excited for it. We have nothing to do with it. <laughs> <laughs> There's no yeah. Um so uh Pete, give us a little background uh of who you are. Where did you start in this industry of off road or even just fab or, or accessories or whatever? Uh give us a little rundown for everybody that's uninitiated of who you are, what you do and who you work with. Um, okay. Well many, many years ago I started in banking and finance. <laughs> so no, actually I did. I worked for a bank. Kicked you out from your beard. I didn't have a beard then. <laughs> I think, uh, I don't remember. It was way back when the economy changed and kind of shifted gears. Uh, and I started working for a buddy that had opened a fab, or a fabrication shop. Did that for a little bit, helping him out. And then, uh, right after that, another friend started something that's gone, by, gone, gone away now. Side by, what was it? You what was there. Mike's company? I can't remember. <laughs> side by side unlimited or side by side. They had a big semi. I can't yeah, I got it. I can't it. <laughs> Anyhow, <laughs> wow. This is, yeah. Well, he don't care anymore. He's out of the industry. Anyhow, so a buddy that had started uh, a side by side shop back, I don't know, mid two thousand, and we did that and did really well. And, and you were doing like. Located stuff or what? Uh, we were just selling. We were kind of a. We started out as a drop shipper, like a lot of people were back then. Um, then morphed into a brick and mortar, uh, and then we we started doing this kind of thing, going to shows and events and selling. So I was a salesman and just, you know, we're a small team like many of these guys, right. selling, putting stuff together, doing some basic installs. Uh, and then at some point, you know, an opportunity came uh, to go work for Pro Armor. We were doing a lot of promo products at that time. Maybe. Just a better deal for me. I mean, there was no, no dramatic leaving or anything like that. Just more money and better opportunities. So right. I went and did that. And it was that back when? Uh, no. 
Marcelo's brother was running in it? Or? Yeah, Alex Dandy. Yeah. Alex yeah. Dandy still owned the company then, and Fred uh, was still a big salesman. Everybody kind of knew Fred Brayton for a long time. Um, so I was working with those guys. And it was, and honestly, it was all in me trying to procrastinate. I always thought, okay, I'm going to have to go back and put a shirt and tie on and go back to banking <laughs> and finance and have a, an adult job, quote unquote. Uh, and I was like, okay, well, I can do this for a little while, you know, and thinking I was going to do that. And then players came along and started purchasing Pro Armor. And I was like, maybe I can make this a career. Like, that's a big company that big boy benefits and 401ks and all that good stuff. So, no, it's been, it's been great. You know, and then fast forward, it's been seven years now, roughly, that I've been with the company. And so, what would you call your title right now? Uh, my title on my business card says <laughs> event specialist. <laughs> you are so, special. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Specialist. Before. No, yeah, but uh, uh, my title is event specialist. So, so, so you're in charge of uh, manning the Pro Armor uh, uh, image at events like this? Yes. Which sounds scary when you put it that way. <laughs> well, I was trying to put the suit and tie on for a second there. Yeah. <laughs> so no, my my main re- one of my main responsibilities is trade shows and events and planning and organizing those and then uh, taking care of the the, the operations once we're in an event things like that. Uh, we're, we're again we're still kind of a small team at Pro Armor. We're just a small part of this giant Polaris brand. Right. Uh, so we a lot of us wear multiple hats. You know, I do that. I take care of. The, all the vehicles at, at the shop, um, all the DOT requirements, kind of voice my opinion probably louder than they like when we do a product <laughs> development, give them my opinion, whether we welcome or not. Right. Uh, but we, yeah, we all share a lot of responsibilities and do whatever we have to make get, make everything get done. A lot of people, uh, have this correlation between Pro Armor and Polaris, obviously, and Polaris, you know, bought out the company, but. The, they do a lot of integration points. So you see Pro Armor all over Polaris' website for accessories and wheels and whatever else. Uh, and you can pretty much see all the accessories on, at least one accessory on all their wheels, right? Like, it's going to be there somewhere. Um, so, but a lot of people don't realize that Polaris buys a lot of companies and then they let them run themselves or assist them running themselves. And so you do have a core team of people that just have the benefits of a little bit more resource options on the big end, right? Um, and so, how it, how did that change the dynamic when you guys got bought out? I mean, I was part of, you know, a company that was first by Polaris. I saw how that changed our company. You know, how did that change Blair, uh, Pro Armor, and how did you guys kind of navigate that to be where you're at now? Um, kind of like you just said, that, you know, a lot of times they, they they come in and buy a company and just kind of let them run autonomously and say, hey, we're hands off, just keep doing what you're doing. And that was our case for, I don't know, the first three or four years. And slowly over the last two or three years, they've kind of integrated Pro Armor into their uh, their websites and their offerings, uh, like you were just talking about, some of our product on on different vehicles and things. Um, so it, it's it's been a it's been awesome. You know, there's a lot of lot of a learning curve there just because to get things done on the corporate side versus you know a smaller company like you said you're aware. You know, when you're just that independent mom pop type shop or you know trying to grow. A board meeting is like this. There's three of us, and you make right. a decision, and hey, we're going to do this, and you can pivot and go after something. So that you lose a little bit of that, you know, now because you've got more people's interest and you have more input. Um, but overall, it's been a positive experience. You know, it's definitely been good for the brand. Um, back when they purchased us, you know, we probably offered half the number of SKUs that we do now. So we've been able to develop a lot more product with the resources. Um, and that's another big thing that's been great for us over the last couple of years is they've started kind of reading us in to vehicle launches and things like that ahead of time. Right. So like, for instance, we, we're, I think you and I talked about it the other night, the pro XP and the pro turbo, uh, cars that just came out and the pro R that everybody's excited about, you know, we've had a chance to develop product for that for the last couple of years. So when the cars launched and dropped, we had, you know, our core product available, you know, roll right. cage, bumpers, doors, seats, that kind of thing. Um, so it was a huge advantage for us. You know, we're first to market on it. Um, and we're, we're really trying to capitalize on that and, you know, fitment and color match and things like that. Promer's really been able to take advantage of, of that relationship. I think one of the first seat, one of the first products you guys came out with for that series was the, the fold up seats, right? Like on the Pro R or in the Pro XP and they had the fold, rear seats that fold up. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I think. Right now, I think we're still like the only one of the only seat companies that does offer that full function of the rear seat of that of that chassis. 
So yeah, that was, was a great a, option in my opinion. I thought that was one of the best design choices they did on that car. Yep. You know, for someone like me, when we're going, you know, out in the woods for days and living off the car, we use those seats for storage and, and other things. So being able to, to take the seat and fold it down and create, you know, that extra cargo room is, is pretty great. 100%. I think the, that was definitely a, a product of the, you know, the interest people have in overlanding, quote unquote, overlanding and camping and things like that. Just like you described, you know, you can you can even put a kid or somebody in one side of the seat and cargo in the other or just fold both seats out. Yeah. So, yeah, and that was a big thing for us. And a lot of guys, they, they take their dogs with them or whatever, and that creates a platform for their animals to, to have a safer experience. So it's just kind of a universal, like, good idea. Yeah, but, for uh, sure. And cool that you guys were able to get, you know, the fold out seat like that. Yeah, you know, it wasn't easy. The guys spent some time trying to develop that and make sure it all worked and, and still retain a, a true suspension seat. Yeah. You know. So when you guys, uh, when you joined the company, uh, what was the kind of like the primary focus product wise? What were you guys focused on making? Back then it was doors. You know, I, that's really, I think, what put us on the map. I mean, I don't know. Brandon could probably attribute or answer that because he was still in the industry then. Um, but he's, he's not in the industry now. <laughs> yeah. Man, it's Saturday after five yeah. days, like you said. It's, it's been, been a long, long week. week. And I'm already thinking about the 16 hour drive to get home. <laughs> um, no, I'd agree for sure, Doors. Yeah. That's what it, yeah. as far, you know, back to the XP 900s and. Yeah, I mean, that's. 900s are where I, or 800s are where I, where I first saw you guys. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, we had a shop build at 509 that was a pretty sweet little unit. Unfortunately, it was all us big guys driving it, so it made it look like a clown car. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> but yeah, no, it was it was back then when we first we started playing with those with those doors. Yeah, I think back then that was you know the big push was was doors and bumpers. there weren't a lot of door manufacturers like in scale. Like there was custom guys, but there wasn't a lot of scaled manufacturing of doors for those back then. No, there wasn't. I mean, I think God, I think it was was it Super ATV or U UTV Giant? I think it was who it was mm. back then. That had a had a door, and they were probably our biggest competitor. And then there was another shop close to us. I can't remember, Blinkstar, um, that you know did a lot of doors as well. But we were one of the, the the big guys on the block as far as that product went, and that was the big focus. Um, and then as the as the as everybody knows, as they developed a car, they started giving you a, a quarter door, a half door, right? You know, so like, oh, well, okay, what are we going to sell now? So. You know, we made a couple variations of the door and started develop getting more into the um, roll cage market, um, pushing our development of a seat so or suspension seats, things like that. So, and then, like we were talking a second ago, being part of a, a bigger company and having some resources, now we started developing wheels and tires and audio um, and lighting and things like that. So it's it's been it's been a fun ride. Yeah, you know, being being part of the Polaris family has be been a huge benefit for us. So when you look back at some of these products, uh, both of you, um, you know, what are kind of some of the uh, challenges in bringing a new product to market that's not something you've worked with before? And, and what kind of makes that experience unique and, and fun versus just grinding away to get something out the door? You go first. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> honestly, the ones that stick out in my mind the most <laughs> recently would probably start with the Pro XP. You know, we were very fortunate that they didn't release a 72-inch model there. And, you know, we were able, you to, were able to capitalize on that. Yep, yeah, exactly. And that was a lot of fun. And we tried a few different things that I would have changed now, you know, looking back. But then uh, obviously this Pro R, it's been it's been a challenge in every way. But the amount we've learned from it and what we can integrate into future product or even change existing, you know, to to some of the designs we've we've looked at with that car, that's that's going to be. That'll be a big one for us. And yeah, and, and we'll get back to that suspension, but there's a yeah. lot of manufacturing on those parts. <laughs> yes. Yeah, that one's been a challenge. It's not a couple tubes welded together with an end on it and some rod ends, and, you know, yep. it, there's a lot of labor in those in those parts. Yep. And, it, and on our end, you know, it's back in the day, it was easy to, you know, widen out a car and put shocks on it because it would be such a huge, dramatic change. These cars are getting better and better and better, so... You right. know, we're really having to put our heads down and where do you put your value? Where do you provide value to the customer? Exactly. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Like he said, I mean, trying to find where you can add value and, you know, get the most bang for your buck uh, to brands. point, I mean, we have nothing to do with suspension, but it's very similar. You know, you look at a car off the showroom floor nowadays, it comes with a, a good looking door. It comes with nice harnesses, depending on what model you get. You know, a lot of those things are already available 
in the initial purchase of the vehicle. So how, trying to provide value to the consumer and let them know that they still need your product. That's, that's a big challenge for, for all of us. I think, I think everybody in the industry, right. you know, Polaris, Can-Am, whoever it is, Cowie, all those guys build awesome vehicles and trying to find a way to provide, you know, significant value to the consumer who goes, Oh, I got to have it. Right. You know, back then it was easy. There wasn't a door. We provided a door and like, Oh, that's amazing. They fit. People felt safer. You know, it was, the cleaner cleaner <laughs> you know it just made it look like a real a full car yeah so it was kind and even, of shooting fish in the barrel <laughs> even like the 900 and thousand s and all that are now coming with doors right and so traditionally polaris has always been the one that we quote unquote yeah. would say skimped out on the doors uh and now they're they're kind of bringing the full door yeah to market I mean, right it's a challenge for both companies they offer a long travel they offer the turbo s they offer the that uh the pro r's with these big wazoo arms which are awesome so yeah you know, and, and in, in that case, you know, the Turbo S came out with big, long arms, and they were b bigger and beefier than the previous generation XPs. But looking, you know, back, where there was plenty of opportunity for HDR to provide a better product, right? There was still a storyline there. Yep. And now we have the Pro R, who has come out with these like bigger arms that are like massive, uh, trailing arms that are massive, uh, and just because of the sheer design work that went into them, you know, they had to be stronger and more resilient. Uh, for the different feature packages, do you find that there's still a market for just ultra durability, ultra capability, like just that safety factor of saying, yeah, the the OE stuff was good, but I'm gonna put my put my family's life <laughs> behind the brands that we trust to to keep us together and safe. Yeah, I mean, it, honestly, that when the Turbo S came out, that was the first suspension I looked at. You know, picked it up and felt it. Like this is this could be the end of of what we do, you know, or the beginning to the end. And uh, we kind of shelved that project for several months and finally got around to doing it. And a lot of it, people want to be different for yep. one. Yeah. Um, but we developed it, really didn't sell a whole lot at first. And then we went out to King of the Hammers, which, you know, you've, yep. you want the beefiest stuff you can get. And we ran into some failures, you know, right out of the gate. And we realized that these cars are just getting bigger and heavier. And, you know, so it was a and pushed harder. Yep. Yep. Big learning curve. And I think same deal with this new Pro R and Turbo R. They're, uh, you can drive them so fast, but the, the difference is, is you're not two handing it and having to drive the vehicle. You can have one hand on the wheel and still be cruising as, six miles as an we hour. know as you held your helmet yeah, down the yeah, whole time. That's right. That's right. <laughs> so with with something like HDR, it's all about that durability, that kind of brute force, like overbuilt, you know, capability. With Pro Armor, what's the approach to creating like a roll cage or something like that where you're you're providing a safety factor? Is it just overbuilt or is it style? Is it like every brand has kind of like a focus that outweighs one another uh, while they're still all accomplishing that goal of safety factor and whatever. Um, do you guys put a lot of emphasis in design and, and, and style? Yeah, and we do. We a, a ton of design, a ton of emphasis in design, style, and safety. I mean, kind of. So to answer your question, see all the above is something that we really focus on now. Um, being part of the Polaris family, and like I mentioned earlier, being integrated into that. You know, there's a lot more resources uh, for us when we're designing a roll cage, for instance. Right. You know, we go through computer uh, simulated crush testing initially. And then once, you know, once we find a design that we like and passes that, you know, we send them off for crush testing. We do have them tested. I think as far as I know, we're probably one of the only people in the industry that does that. You know, uh, with, the, with the, the corporate liability on it, you have to have some sort of granular testing and, and evidence that this is going to be a safe product yeah yeah i mean not only because of that because we want to provide a safe cage right we all but. intend that but <laughs> but a lot of places just can't afford yeah to no, go through that exactly. process getting it, certification and stuff is hard yeah no exactly yeah it, it's definitely due to our relationship with them that, that we're able to do that and take advantage of that so uh, specifically on roll cages i mean that's come a long way for us in the last four or five years i think we've been doing that right. Um, and I've had to carry a few of those and they're not like lightweight aluminum cages for sure. They're stout. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I know exactly. You know, it's, I've been, I've watched the guys develop the cage and help. Like I said, I kind of opened my mouth too much on the product development side, but you know, over there kind of 
well, what if we move the tube here and did that? Trying to still provide all the style points that every consumer wants out there, um, but keep them safe at the same time. So on, on the product development side, yeah, the, you know, like one, definitely looking into keeping the consumer safe, make sure they still look cool riding in, in one of our vehicles or a vehicle with our product. Um, and, you know, another big thing that we're able to do is like colors and things like that. You know, uh, we provide, I don't, God, I want to say we're probably 25 to, yeah, probably about 25 different colors that we powder coat in-house now. Um, and they're all well, Polaris factory colors. So like if you. Because you have the, you have the powder to match. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, definitely take advantage of that. And it's it's a big feather in our cap. Yeah. You know, if you want to order a sky blue cage or a sky blue door from Pro Armor, it matches your sky blue suspension or, right. you know, our red or the three different oranges they offer now, you know, whatever it is. So that's that's a big thing for us as well. But we spend a lot of time in in design. Um, you know, we have some in-house guys now that, that we've that have come on board with us in the last couple of years. And they just really focus on that. So that that's the nice thing about it. I think one thing that a lot of I hear a lot when we're at events like this that people like about our cars is because we do offer so many different products. We offer bumper, doors, cage, all that. It flows from one to the other. That's you know? what I was going to say is you have not only the consistency part of it where everything looks like it goes together, but that the style points, the the integration points, all of it matches. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, and that's that's a big thing for us with our relationship with dealers. You know, well, we'll we do a we have a what we call pro built uh, in house where you know a lot of the local dealers can send us a car and a crate. We build the car uh, with all of our product to their spec, and it's you know the showpiece on the showroom floor, and it people love it just because, like you said, it it flows. You know, the bumper still has some of the styling cues that are seen in the roof and the roll cage, and then it flows into the rear bumper. So. It, it, it we're we're able to take advantage of it and it, it's been good for us so you guys uh are kind of roadies i would call you mm. um brandon you you, carnies, you have whatever carnies uh you you have a little bit more of a role at behind a desk a lot of the time too but uh for the most part you guys are still out on the show circuit running you know every other week or whatever the case is during the summer uh kind of give me the backstory on how you guys met and and uh what some of the some of the craziness there is this has had, over the years developed I don't know, even know if I remember when we actually met. It's been a lot of years ago. Yeah, I, I want was, a was his beard brown at that time? Or yeah, I think it? both of ours were a little more brown. <laughs> yeah, <no. laughs> I have two teenage daughters, and I think uh, that's the, the the reason for the gray. Um, no, I think it was it was a it was a what do you call it? Rally, rally rally the rocks. rocks yep. Okay, yep. I think it was rallying the rocks. And Brandon, I don't remember the whole story. Sorry, I don't remember. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you're you're striking out on all these memories. <laughs> I know, man. There's a lot. No, we, I think we met. Uh, uh, Brittany was still with the company, and I know I had known Brittany and Damon for a handful of years with them, and he was new, just hanging out at Rallying the Rocks, and then just kind of being the carnies or roadies, however you want to say it, over the last the next year or two, just hanging out like, Hey, we're going to go have dinner. Let's go have dinner and end up having a few beers and you know, whatever adventures we get into. Um, after that, you know, there's, there's been quite a few. Well, and it's the, the fun part about, you know, the traveling circus, whatever you want to call it is you, you team up with certain people, but the, it's fun to be able to have a friend, you know, to come right. hang out with your second family. You know, it, it turns into a, a reunion every time. Yeah, yeah. You really look forward to hanging out and seeing each other because otherwise we wouldn't. Right. And uh, yeah, it's become it's been very good. We've we've worked together on a few projects. You know, over the last few years, we've tried to start you know teaming up yeah. and help build our brands. You know, and kind of piggyback off each other in that sense as well. So really yeah, I good. think that's one of the cool aspects of uh, show life is is developing those relationships that you wouldn't have otherwise with brands that are like minded and uh really have the same kind of focus as you do and when you're on the same page as somebody you know you really kind of click and have a good time and so um that's why i like events like this where it's not just like a rodeo like arena with everybody in it it's yep. it's getting outdoors and and going and shooting and and ripping and then go watching some people huck it and then you know, coming down here, throwing some product out across the table and then going back out for more rips, you know, there's this, this whole, it's almost like 
you know, being happy that you work. Yep. Right. Yeah, for sure. No, I mean, you, it, none of this is easy. So if we didn't enjoy it, it probably wouldn't have stuck with it as long as we have, you know, I mean, driving 16 hours, setting up a booth for two or three hours. I'll vouch for that part of it not being fun. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so you definitely enjoy it. I mean, it's not, I don't know that it's for everybody, but it works for us. And, you know, partnering with them, they're, they're awesome. Like he said, we've tried to, you know, we've worked on a couple of projects together, both the companies, um, and they're very like-minded, like HCR is very much like us, you know, trying to play as big as you are on a bu budget and, you know, and still be scrappy with it. Like, like you mentioned, getting out and doing the hot dog thing, you know, it's not a huge expense, but it goes a long way. Yeah. The consumer likes that. So we've, we've done that a couple or, you know, assisted with that on a couple of events with them. Um, or, and it's nice to be able to do stuff like that where <clears throat> it's not hands off to the, the community right the yep. community yeah. can partake in that and be with everybody and it provides them opportunity to meet people that they wanted to have otherwise met and and, and have story time with those guys right yeah and that dialogue is priceless in their opinion they're going to go home and then every brand they interacted with every personality they interacted with is now going to you know stick with them for a long time oh yeah i mean then we go on the group rides like we're around the rocks you know you get out there and somebody blows a tire we get out and help them or he spots he's amazing at that um and they're just like, oh, man, the guys from HR helped her. The guy from Pro Armor helped her. You know, sitting around a campfire afterwards, uh, sharing, a, sharing a beer, and they're talking to you about their car, and you talk to them about yours, and it just it goes a long way. But we're able to do that because we're both enthusiasts first. I mean, I've said it before, and he does too. You'd still be at events like this, even if I had a different job. Right. You know, I mean, I'd still be – I'd still own a Razor. I'd still – come to off-road events it's just what i enjoy and he does as do you, well would you drive 16 hours to oregon <laughs> <laughs> i would but it would definitely this time of year with the fuel bill i would definitely have to take a closer look at it <laughs> yeah i'm kidding so uh considering how much experience you guys have on the road what are your, some of your favorite places to ride and, and uh get out to explore gosh this one's pretty hard to beat i'm not gonna lie when it comes to dunes and just they're it's just different, you know, the uh, being able to every time we come out onto the ocean. Yeah, it's just a surreal. Never feeling. gets old. No, yeah, no. It's, a, it's so epic to be able to run the beach for I don't know how many miles that stretch is, but it's so cool to do that. And then Jim and his team, this is like you mentioned earlier, it's a killer event, like to be able to have all those activities going on, come in here, buy a part, run back out, ride like this is definitely about not I guess a bucket list one that we've been able to check off several times now. Um, I, I, I've said it a hundred times on the podcast that when my first experience happened at, at hurricane, like my mind was just kind of like, I knew it was beautiful and I knew that it was a pretty op epic scenery wise, but getting out and expo ex exploring the glassy sand and then into the rocks and then into, you know, these wind cut caverns and then down massive cliffs and, you know, then going to the beach and then, go, you know, yeah. I agree with you hundred percent. San hollow is definitely on there. I mean, I know it's his backyard, so probably a little jaded to it, but I'm fortunate enough to go. We probably go there two or three times a year for something different. And uh, to my bad, I haven't brought my family or made the effort to take my family up there on a camping trip. And every time I be there, I'm like, Man, I really want my family to experience this. Right. And, and I it, said the same thing. Yeah. And I, I, shame on me for not making it happen so far. But every time I'm like, we leave, I'm like, dude, we, we got to set this up and you come down with your family and we'll go ride. And, and we haven't done it yet. So, yeah. but that's probably top one or two, Sand Hollow. I'm trying to think what else. I mean, no, really, it's, they're all unique in their own way. Like Arkansas, getting out in the mud. That was a yeah. whole new experience that, I'll never forget. And it's just cool to be out and see people enjoying the same thing we do, but in such a different way. Yeah. And I had, uh, when I went to Virginia last year, just being introduced to a whole different culture of writing, mm -hmm. um, not just, you know, cultural, like people wise, but cultural writing, like just, yeah. they approach it differently than yeah. we do over here on the West coast yeah. and, uh, the top topography, how, it, how varied it is and how crazy and gnarly it can be and change in t like 50 feet, like from right. grandma trail to like, you better have your a game stuff yep. all in the one little area. Uh, you know, the, this country, let alone, you know, the side of the world is so vast and various. And like we buy these cars for adventure and excitement and adrenaline. 
like we we need to get out and and go explore a little bit more than we our little our little off road trail whatever by our our city whatever that is. Yeah, for sure. I agree with you. I mean, it's it's a fun, capable machine that gets you out and the family out. And there's so much out there. Like we've been fortunate enough to do it for work. Go see all these different areas, and definitely encourage anybody, you know, to to go outside of their comfort zone. Go to Utah if you're from here. Go to Texas and go to a mud park. You know, it's so it's definitely when we talk about those different types of riding. You know, Brandon, you're obviously a little bit jaded towards the bigger wheeled cars. Um, out here, you know, sand cars are a little bit the thing. And, and where you're at, I'm sure the desert kind of area is probably more the style. Glamis um, is home for me. <laughs> okay. So what, what are your favorite kind of build styles? Like, obviously, we're going to hear about 42s and stuff from Brandon <laughs> uh, and big portals. But, you know, Pete, what, what, what's, what's, what do you, where do you lean on your, on your car preference? Uh, of course, Polaris. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no idea. I flares the new car is amazing. Um, don't have a ton of experience in it yet. I mean, obviously the availability. Do I, you have a turbo R? Personally? Oh, to work on. Yeah, yeah. So at the shop we have a two seat turbo. R, or, I'm sorry, we have two four seat, two seat and four seat turbo R, and two seat and four seat Pro R. Gotcha. Because the turbo the turbo R is kind of the unicorn car that. A lot of people have been waiting to get their hands on and, and obviously players staggered production when they launched the cars right yeah so we'll see the turbo r becoming more popular but that was kind of like my car pick for the year last year was like that was the happy medium between the advancement in the t- suspension technology and the reliability and performance options in the aftermarket right away at launch right yeah you could go out and get a big tune and put down a couple hundred, hundred horsepower and you know upgrade all the parts and all the upgrade accessories and and all that stuff right away um, whereas the pro R needed some development. Right. Uh, so I, I was super stoked to see a pro turbo R set up, you know, as soon as I could, cause I wanted to see what the, the rate weight ratio was different, you know, on the powertrain and yeah, all that sure. stuff. But, uh, so tell me a little bit about your development process on, on the pro R turbo R, you know, platform. How's, how did that differ than, you know, Brandon saying, you know, there's a lot more geometry, there's a lot more man hours into creating something was, was your guys's approach any similar or different? Um, no, similar to his, I mean, like they're not on the suspension side where all the complication was right. You're on the, the upper side. Yeah. Yeah. We're, I guess, accessories and, you know, pr- production roll cage, bumpers, doors, that type of thing. Um, so yeah, definitely having that relationship. We've been working on that project for God, I don't know, two years already by the time the car launched. So we're already had a, a firm grasp of what direction we were going. Um, but it goes back to like we were saying before, you know, the, the cars come so capable off the showroom floor. Um, you really got to get finite with where you're going to add benefit to the consumer with your product, you know. So we're looking at a door and design something that's definitely stylish but offers them, you know, something on the interior. You know, we offer a door bag that they can, you know, protect them from bouncing their knees off of, you know, that kind of thing. Um, but, yeah, it, it, it was definitely – a little tougher i mean it gets tougher every time they launch a new chassis because there's so much technology getting put into them you know between the ride command uh and navigation um audio now that you know rockford's a big partner for polaris and they a lot of the cars the premiums and the ultimates are coming with with audio equipment in them right off the showroom so you know trying to add value there is is definitely getting more and more challenging which is fun for our team you know, it is, it, it's good because that's what we're no, here for. No one wants to get bored behind the desk. Yeah. yeah. You know, you just don't want a rubber stamp. So I'm like, okay, car comes out, same kind of bumper, same kind of this. No, it, it's really, it's getting challenging, which has been fun for us. You guys got into the wheel game, you know, over the last few years or whatever. Uh, what, what, what are, what's different with designing a wheel versus like a roll cage? Um, a lot. I mean, because there's, you kind of got to, you, you get out there and you look and you don't want to copy somebody else. You want it to be unique, but and you're you don't find to this like circle. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So on that, you know, we come up with our ideas and then we really lean on our uh, industrial design guys. You know, we have a couple of those guys in house and they knock it out of the park, but you don't want to copy something else. Like you got right here in this, where we're sitting, I'm looking at some beautiful race line wheels. They're awesome. Um, so you don't want to try it. You're trying to come up with something unique, but you don't want to come up with something that looks like it belongs on a 55 Chevy. Right. either you know charlie you're trying to stay relevant with style and colors it, it's a lot of work for a wheel you yeah. know 
And then the at the end, I think I don't know if it was Brandon I was talking to last night, but somebody. Um, once you get to the end of it, you got to name the wheel, or you got to <laughs> name the product, and you're just like, oh my god, I've worked on this thing for a year, and yeah. just want to be done with it, and you're trying to come up with a, na- a name that's unique that isn't going to be consu- confusing for the consumer on your website, and doesn't sound like somebody else's product. I mean, th- there's a lot. It's yeah. it's tough. Um, Brandon, when we talk about uh, designing the the Pro R suspension. Um, where do you guys start? Like, as far as suspension goes, you already have previous existing designs. Do you take those and then start chipping away at those and, and changing them? Or do you look at the OE part and kind of start building from there out? So, I mean, you always try and stick with, you know, a similar look and everything else. But with this kit, I wanted to change our look. I wanted it to be just something totally different. Um, you know, we've learned a lot over the years getting out in the rocks and, uh impacting rocks different things we have a lot of sharp edges and those sharp edges blow out the powder coat and everything else so this kit really doesn't have very many sharp edges all the the impact points are all smooth welded uh pieces and the contact point like across the trailing arm is only like an inch and a half wide where our other arms are a couple two three inches wide so a lot of a lot of thought went into those things just to uh help Basically, like King of the Hammers type stuff, you know, just less impact, less drag. And, and, and you guys did some changes with that suspension. You had some opportunities for changes, right, with the lower shock mount mm-hmm. and and things like that. And you're plus a number of inches on different areas. Can you kind of explain what you did there? So this vehicle, we did not change any geometry. It's it's a OEM specs. So I mean, it handles and works so well. We didn't want to screw that up. We just wanted to really looking at that car. She, that lower arm is it they did a, such a good job but it's it's a snow shovel it, right <laughs> it hangs so low so we were able to gain three inches of ground clearance on the front a arms and we gained two inches on the rear trailing arm and that's actually a lot compared right you know we usually shoot for an inch inch and a half on most of our stuff but we were able to gain a lot in that way and and i really that's kind of the biggest reason why anyone's going to spend the money on that kit is because you know, to gain that ground clearance. Otherwise, the stock components are really quite built well. Yeah, and a lot of people, when we, when you look at the marketing materials, are saying clearance, you know, number at certain locations, which might necessarily be an actual true number, you know, whatever. Uh, a lot of those numbers don't uh, reflect the fact that the hardware itself can hang down, you know, especially around the hubs, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, a lot of uh, obstacles are usually first met at the hub. So, so having more clearance there, but yet more rigidity and more durability is a, is a huge part of that, I think. Yep, yep, 100%. And these, I mean, I, I joke about it, but in most situations, if you break one of our arms, you've got a lot bigger problems than a broken arm. <laughs> your arm's probably not attached to your car yeah, at that point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, that, but it has, it's, it's, been, it's been a challenge. We, we got two kits. We got one on our own car, and then on Billy's, our brand ambassador, and we've been beating on them hard all week, and fortunately, everything's good. There's a few minor tweaks, but and and I think I've mentioned earlier on podcasts this week uh, that I rode in your four seater with you, and that thing was, you know, I don't think you've done much other to it than the the arms and stuff on it, right? Just a set, you know, cage doors. It's the bolt on stuff. Yep, yep. Uh, no, so it's bone it's, stock. Like, does it have a shock goes. package or anything? No, it had a spring package, spring and it's package. actually at MTS today getting a. Oh, they're doing they're a full, full tune. Full yep. tune. Okay. Yep. So it's in a ride even better than I had yes. experienced. And uh, it was already really quite different than any other Razor that I've driven in. Right. Uh, well, that was with four adults. You can't put four adults in any stock car. I've never been in it. a four seat with four adults and not have back pain when I was done. Right. Like, that's just the truth of it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And even on built cars. Like, yeah. it's, just, it's just what it is, especially out here at the dunes with the ruts and stuff that you get developed on some of these trails. Um, but yeah, we, I think we touched tail a little bit on one with a yeah, deep, I didn't with check a deep... up enough on one, <laughs> one part, but other than that, it did well, but it wasn't hard. No, no. It was just kind of like, oh yeah, you're there. Yep. Right. Yep. So I was thoroughly impressed with the pro R four seater. The power band seemed natural. Mm-hmm. Like it didn't seem like, so you go into can am and you, you hit that throttle wrong and it feels like out of nowhere, you just got slapped in the face with, with po- power. Yep. yep. Um, and that's kind of their thing. That's their, they're known for that. Uh, I've always been a fan of the pro Polaris like linear program where you just the more you push the more you go mm-hmm. um, and it seemed like you'll, you'll have to tell me because I didn't drive it that 
that the power band seems to have that kind of natural, like how your body moves is how it actually kind of integrates that power band. Yeah, that's a really good way to put it. And it really is going back to suspension. When you put four adults in a UTV, you it's slow. It's, you know, it ruins. It doesn't corner good. It yeah, doesn't do yeah. move good. You know, this, everything falls apart. Right. That This car is the first one I can put four people in it and I can still have. And we're not fun. small guys. No, no, <laughs> no. That it'll, you know, still do everything you need it to do. Right. And, and drive aggressively. And you were still sliding around, having yeah, fun and, yeah. and push, pushing hard and pulling back and going forward again. Like. It was no different than like a two seater with a single person in it. Exactly. And that's where that car truly shines is it's just very versatile. It, you know, you can do a lot of things and not have it change the the dynamics of it, I guess. So uh, looking at the show this week, we're wrapping up here for Huckfest and Willie Fest and all that jazz. Um, yesterday, I saw a lot of guys out there ripping HDR parts on the short course and, and having a good time. Saw some pro armor cages out there. Um, what are you guys looking forward to this season as we go forward? That's kind of like the question I like to end with is, is what are we looking forward to? This year's halfway through, right? Uh, the show season doesn't just kind of started not too long ago, um, and it gets pushing hard here over the next few months and into August and all that. Um, what are you guys looking forward to? Go ahead. So circuit-wise or product-wise, they got anything coming out? Um, yeah, the guys are constantly working on a new product, um, so there's always something looking to look forward to on the product side, um, wheels and tires and things like that. But I'm just looking to kind of grow the brand in unique markets. You know, like we mentioned earlier, uh, Pro Armor and HCR teamed up a couple months ago, and we went back to a big mud event in Mississippi. Um, so just trying to grow the brand in different markets. You know, we're based out of the Southwest and have been in like like – like everybody, you know, that's where you're strongest, you know, it starts to dilute as you get further and further away. So just opportunities to grow our brand and get out and have some fun, you know. You got any shows coming up that are kind of like key locations that you're excited about? Um, I Well, I'm still kind of on the bubble, but we're looking at going to Jay, Oklahoma, the Vision off-road event. So we're still trying to sort that out. Um, I'm hoping to pull that off for the first time. That's one that that I'm really looking forward to. So I hope we do that. Um, and then I'm hoping for Polaris to have something in Glamis for Camp Razor time this year. I don't know if it's going to happen, but I think so. I'm really hoping. That'd, I mean, that'd big be a big deal if yeah. Camp Razor came back this year. Um, yeah. You know, the being out uh, since COVID and all that stuff, and then last year it's still not coming back. Um, you know, the community down there would probably just throw the biggest party ever if, <laughs> if yeah, Camp Razor sure. came back. You know, so. they, I. I know the know the girl that is in charge of that and you know they've had some great ideas and some fun fun ideas for the last couple of years so if they're able to pull it off this year it'll be great and and having a, a real popular new car the pro r and the turbo r is available you know kind of showcase those right i think it would be an awesome event for you know something worth you coming down and i know brandon and the team will be there if we do that so i'm, I'm really hoping for that and then of course sancho you know yeah. Yeah, Sancho was pretty cool uh, going this last year to it and, and experiencing that for the first time. Uh, huge community down there, you know. It, it, it's truly a UTV show now. I mean, I, I've grown up a sand kid, like I said, Glamis is home, and my dad's had sand rails and all my life, and I, I love them. But you go, you walk in there, and it's more of a UTV oh, yeah, show than sure. anything and else. We talked about that at the show when we were podcasting last time. Was was how much UTV has taken over, right? And <clears throat> what that means for the trucking community and the sand rail community and all that. And, um, but for the most part, you know, we're all the same family. Right. And so we all ex enjoy the growth and the, and the technology and all that stuff. And, and you saw, you know, Funko's there, you saw sand rail slingshots, you saw all sorts of different stuff there, uh, trophy trucks and, uh, you know, Gordon brought his whole unit down there and everything else. Um, so I, I think it's kind of a cool concept, but you know, it is overtaking everything out there. And um, one thing I like to hit on on most of my shows is just continue to educate your friends, the people that are coming to the market, help them understand what our community means and keep our community the way it is and not lose our, our ability to ride and enjoy areas like down in Moab or, you know, on some of these trails that they're trying to shut down. So um, and we've had some good luck, right? We've had like um, the Pismo stuff and um all that stuff coming back and and uh some some real good success there but it takes some hard hard work for some some group of people to do that and we need to support them so uh volunteer for your your ride groups to go do trail cleanup go you know message your senators and your in your legislators to make sure we keep our our riding trails open because it's such a big part of what we do 
Yep, yep, I'm with you. We have a group called UTV Utah, and man, they they put a lot of effort into that stuff, and I truly appreciate it. And I, I've kind of become a grumpy old man when it comes to uh, people writing, not your writing style. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> no, like just people not disrespecting the streets and you know driving these things around like there's no rules because right. they don't understand how how easy it can be taken away. Right. You know, and, I and hate, you won't hate get it back. That. Exactly. Well, as soon as it's gone, it's gone. Yep. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like to your point, the ASA, uh, American Sand Association, we we work with them and help support them. Um, they're an awesome group that is a land rights. Uh, I guess that's the best way to say it. Land rights uh, ambassadors. Yeah. Um, God, can't think of the word. But anyhow, but supporting those kind of people, and like Brandon said, I mean. I've become that way too. We go for a ride and I come home with more trash in my car than I, when I left, you know, we got our, right. our empty uh, soda cans and whatnot or lunch, but you end up coming home with more just cause I don't want to see it go away. I love all of this, you know, regardless if it's riding in the sand or we're on a trail in Moab or wherever, you know, we definitely got to do our part and be respectful of our environment, you know? And I think that's one thing that brings us a lot of us, like the, the three of us together is this community it's it's definitely unique you know you come in and you kind of got to not earn your way in but you got to be respectful and earn the right to come out and enjoy these trails by taking care of uh yeah you come out to the dunes and if you don't respect them you know right away they're gonna slap you back right and oh yeah and then the community is not gonna be excited to have you there if you're not respecting the territory and their space and everything else too so well and your fellow riders like that's one a huge one too people are just so they are in their own lane and that's no one else around them matters and i think that just just educating people like you said is huge and especially when we do events like this right like when we if we do rally on the rocks or or takeover or or whatever uh you know we we should be stewards of the land and leave it better than we found it especially when we are the ones coming as a large group right we are the virus coming in to take over the land yep. we know we should be leaving it cleaner than we than we found it yeah 100 percent. i think both of our companies have done a good job with that and we continue to try and you know do that and i like he said the ut U, utah utv or whatever that group utah, is utah yeah yeah they they part of that we help with the asa you know, we do Glamis cleanup stuff, so um, definitely and I trying think to Glamis do it. is one of those unique places where that storyline is really trying hard to play out. Like, you know, I don't think Glamis is really in threat of being lost at the moment. Like, there's no legislation that I can think of that's pushing against it. But at the same time, there are every month a group going out there to do cleanup and do, you know, pick up your belt that you blew out the yeah. side of your car or left beer bottles in the dunes or whatever the case is. There's there's evidence of our community doing well out there, and I think it's awesome, and I uh, we should applaud them and help them when we can. Yeah. Um, being a mountain guy, I come from the northwest of, you know, guys that just go out on their own, party it up, and then go home and leave all their stuff out there. Yeah. And you know that's that's where we need education is our home turf, right? Each one of us, our home turf, where that that could be, New Hampshire or right. whatever, right? Like it, as long as we're protecting our lands as a group, we're not going to lose it as a group. Yeah, no, 100% agree with you on that, man. Well, uh, end of the week, we got a fun day ahead. Uh, I think everyone's excited to um, not only wrap the show up, but also get some sleep. Um, <laughs> that's something we've lacked out here. Uh, and uh, I think I can speak for everyone. We're having a great time out here. Um, a lot of uh, good opportunities, a lot of good people to talk to. Um, and uh, yeah, can't speak enough uh, about the community and how much we love being here. So uh, Brandon, uh, obviously HDRracing.com, I believe. Yep. And um, Facebook, Instagram, all that stuff. Pete, where can we find you guys? How can we follow you? Do you have a, a ro- traveling road circus Instagram or TikTok we can follow? Uh, <laughs> yeah, I'll see all of them. Yeah, we have got, uh, got all that. But yeah, proarmor.com is, uh, you know, to get to our website and our product. Um, and then I think it's at proarmor.com for all our social media. Okay, cool. So uh, for the uh, takeover, you can go to take, utvtakeover.com or all their social channels. You can follow us at Side by Side Guys on Instagram, Facebook, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, uh, iHeartRadio, all those different places. Uh, and if you would love to see the triad of facial hair, you can follow us on YouTube <laughs> and watch us there as well. So uh, look forward to some content coming out of this show along with the podcast. Uh, and uh, until next time, guys, peace. Peace.